Some of you may know that the world's biggest comic book movie fan is Martin Scorsese. Woo! Oh, wait, no, that's wrong. <laughs> there hasn't been anybody as outspoken against comic book movies than Martin <laughs> Scorsese. And let me rephrase, the great Martin Scorsese. Because this dude is unbelievable. Like, he will go down on the Mount Rushmore. He is one of the greatest to ever do it. Uh, he's got a new one coming out, Killers of Flower Moon, which I am so excited to see. He is absolutely one of the best that we've ever had. However, he's also not been afraid to stir the pot a little bit. You guys will remember back in 2019, he came out, you know, turning off a lot of film fans with comments about how comic book movies aren't real cinema. It's like, what? And listen, the smartest, best, Michael Jordan threw up air balls once in a while. Greatest of all time, he would throw up air balls sometimes, <laughs> right? He would. He threw air balls up. And, you know, even the best of the best of the best are going to have a bad day. I think that was a really bad uh, interpretation of the situation that it came on. Well, a lot of time has come, and I, you knew reporters will keep asking him about it. And in promoting his new film that he's got coming out, Killers <laughs> of the Flower Moon, he kind of decided to double down a little bit again when somebody brought it up to ask him about it. And he made two big points that I, I want to give some counters to. But this is what Martin Scorsese said. He said, the theaters have to step up to make them places where people will want to go and enjoy themselves or want to go and see something that moves them. If Hollywood makes nothing but comic book and franchise movies, now, now he's not just talking about comic book, he's talking about franchises. If Hollywood makes nothing but comic book and franchise movies and certain segments of the audience don't want to see those films, then nothing is going to get them into a cinema. The danger there is what it's doing to our culture. Because there are going to be generations now that think movies are only those. That's what movies are. All right. I, right at the outset, the first thing I would say, if I was Martin Scorsese's agent or whatever, it's like, look, there are a lot of movie fans out there who are fans of franchises and fans of, Star Wars, fans of Harry Potter, fans of comic book movies. There are a lot of people out there. What are you gaining by disenfranchising those people? What are you gaining by alienating those people? Because Martin Scorsese's had some controversy in his life and career, sure. But never has something come up where I literally, I remember, Rob, you were you remember this in 2019. A lot of people were suddenly saying like, F Martin Scorsese and blah, blah, blah. Like, what, when have we ever heard people say that, right? All because, and I don't care, he doesn't like comic book movies, he doesn't like franchises, that's fine. Nobody has to like that stuff. But as a filmmaker himself, I don't know what the advantage was of alienating a bunch of people saying that. Now, I want to look at this statement by him specifically. Because there are two things he says that are true. However, I want to offer two counters to his points. Let's go back and look at the, the quote again here. He says, people, you got to make movies. People want to go to see something that moves them. And if Hollywood makes nothing but comic book franchise movies, there are certain segments of the audience that won't want to go see those films. Okay, he's not wrong. Newsflash. People who don't like comic book movies aren't going to go see comic book movies. Okay, yeah, I, I, I agree with that 100%. He's not wrong. And he's also not wrong in saying, you know, if Hollywood makes nothing but comic book and franchise movies, by the way, still today, those are the minority of the films that come out. I know it feels like they're the majority, but they're not. They're actually in the large minority, comic book movies and franchise films. But if you make nothing but those, there's going to be a bunch of people that don't come to the cinema. Absolutely right. Well, my counter to that is this. If all you put out are Killers of the Flower Moon type of movies, there's a lot of people that won't go to the cinemas. I mean, you're right. If you only put out one kind of movie, that means there's going to be a bunch of people that don't go. I agree. You're not wrong. But it works the other way around, too. If you just put out cop movies, not there's going to be a bunch of people that don't go to the movies. If you put out nothing but rom-coms, there's going to be a bunch of people that don't go to the movies. If you put out nothing but period pieces, there's going to be a bunch of people that don't go to the movies. And if all you put out is comic book movies or franchise films, yeah, there's going to be a bunch of people that don't go to the movies, but it works for every other part as well. It goes both ways. And, and then he makes this statement, right, right up in the top couple lines. People will want to go and enjoy themselves or want to go and see something that moves them. 
I agree. Movies are meant to be emotional experiences, whether it's fear, laughter, contemplation, grief, like whatever. We go to movies for emotional experiences. I call them experiential events. And you're right. People want to go to see movies that move them. But here's the thing, Martin. You know, I, I recently went down a rabbit hole. I don't know how and I don't know why on YouTube. And I went down this rabbit hole of watching people's online reactions to Game of Thrones, The Red Wedding. <laughs> I, I have never seen anything in a Martin Scorsese movie move people the way that moved people. When you see rooms that fill with 20 people burst into tears and weeping and crying and screaming and, and whatever, not many films, even my all-time favorite films, have rarely delivered an emotional experience or something that moved them on that level. I still remember when Opie died in Sons of Anarchy, man. That devastated me. <laughs> that broke me in a way that a lot of films, you know, certainly haven't before. Or House of the Dragon. Like when, I know man, not everybody's watched season one, but, you know, <laughs> a certain character riding a certain animal, like, dies. And I'm like, and I was like, shocked and moved and in awe because here's the thing martin who is a god and i worship at the altar of martin scorsese but you want to talk about movies that people will relate to and, and identify with and be moved by wolf of wall street is a brilliant brilliant movie but i'm going to tell you what people i can identify more and relate more to a ms marvel about a young girl who find it awkward to be in high school and searching for identity and what her place in the world is. Yeah, turns out she has a superpower too, but I mean that then a rich billionaire dude who gets busted by the feds and goes to prison. They all have merit and they all work to deliver an emotional experience. And all movies deliver different kinds of emotional experiences. It does not elevate one over the other. One of the most moving scenes, not the, but one of the most moving scenes I've ever seen, Infinity War. A CGI raccoon talking to a Norse god and the Norse god talking about all the loss that he suffered in his life. And I'll tell you what, you can, you can focus on the fact that it's a CGI raccoon talking to a Norse god. Yeah, you can do that. But that scene emotionally moved me. And it resonated. Like many Martin Scorsese movies do too. So yes, if you only make comic book movies, 100%, you're alienating a bunch of the audience. But you can say that about any other, if you only make any other kind of movie too. I want to talk about this thing as well. When he says this, the danger there is what it's doing to our culture. Because there are going to be generations now that think movies are only those. That's what movies are. That movies are only comic book movies. Point to me one year when we had 12 comic book movies come out. Point one year out to me that had 12 comic book movies come out. You can't. At least not big Hollywood wide release comic book films. Has it? Oh, I can point to you a number of years on how many cop movies came out or crime movies came out or murder mystery movies came out or rom-coms came out. I mean, yeah, you say there could be a generation. Guess what? People live for 80 years never even thinking you could have comic book movies on screen. They're having their moment now, sure. But generations of people thought, oh, movies are everything but the things I like. You know, John Schnepp, Rob, you and, you and Schnepp would, would often, we would talk on Heroes a bunch. We would talk about the fact that, you know, you guys went through your teens, your 20s, your 30s, never thinking we could ever see this stuff on screen. There were generations of people who thought the movies were for everything but the things they liked. So yeah, comic book movies are having their time if you look at the last 15 years. Yeah, they're having their time right now. But even in that, there were decades that were predominantly dominated by certain subgenres of movies, but we never worried that people are going to look back and think that's the only thing that movies are. If all you made were cop movies, like, again... I see what he's saying. He's not wrong. You don't want a generation to look back and only think that this is what a movie is and it's only comic book films. Of course not. But Rob, that's not what's happening today. These are the ones that are succeeding a lot, sure. But that's the audience dictating that. So there's truth in things that Martin is saying. I just think that 
they're truths that are part of a revolving door that go both ways. And I think he's overlooking a couple of things here. And again, I say this with all reverence for Martin Scorsese. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Mint Mobile. Signing your life away to a big wireless provider is kind of like being trapped on a roller coaster from hell. Sure, it looks like fun at first. They probably even threw in a free phone, but now you can't get off. Month after month of insane bills and unexpected thrills, like overages and surprise fees. If that sounds like your current big wireless plan, it's time to get off the ride with Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just 15 bucks a month. You guys know before, I came to Mint Mobile, I was paying triple what I am paying now on the standard big wireless plan, and I will never go back. All plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped right to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com dot com slash campia cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia rob you heard the new comments being made by martin about franchises and you know comic book movies and things like that what's your take on them? well i mean i think what he's really speaking about is the fact that the cultural landscape that we live in now is very different you know every decade's different from the decade before and and motion pictures as they stand now are different in terms of the cultural conversation than they were 10 years ago or 10 years before Just that. Just as the 80s were different from the 70s, the 70s a were different from the 60s. Absolutely. And, and it used to be, and one of the big problems is the studios now are making movies for a global audience. Whereas 25 years ago, the global audience, the box office, you, you, you never had, movies made most of their money domestically. Now, a lot of these big movies make most of their money foreign. So in order to travel foreign, they can only make certain films, like comedies don't really travel well foreign because comedy is colloquial. You know, it's local. And how can you expect one country that's very different than this country understand our humor? So big, huge blockbuster comedies don't get made as much anymore. And I think what he's worried about, like studios used to make, like Paramount would make, over the course of a couple of years, you'd get a Footloose, a Fatal Attraction, and a Hunt for Red October all from the same studio. And the studios would make all different kinds of movies to appeal to different kinds of audiences, but they weren't spending $200 million to make a billion worldwide. So the business has changed and it's limited the kinds of movies that are getting made. The flip, of, the flip side of that, which he, I wish he would mention more, is that a lot of the kinds of movies that the studios used to make have moved over to television and streaming. Yeah, that's where, a big point too. We're, we're, yeah. you know, we're getting all of these great dramas and really interesting uh, stories being told in novelistic fashion on streaming services. I have to tell you, John, I watched a banger of a low-budget movie that came out of Ireland called Lola. Oh, Black oh yeah. And, yeah, I saw yeah. that. Black and white movie. Did you watch it? Yep. Man, I this movie was so clever about these two girls in the 40s that create a machine that they name after their dead mother, mm -hmm. Lola, that can receive broadcasts from the future. It was a total science fiction movie, totally low budget. I was enthralled by this movie. And it was just as thrilling, and it, well, maybe not just as thrilling and enthralling as a $200 million movie, mm -hmm. but what I really liked about it was, at scale, I was enchanted charmed and then i was like oh my god what's going to happen and there is like you always point out a wide variety of movies being made if you choose to look for them yes it's just that at the mm -hmm. studio level the movies that are dominating the cultural conversation and even our genre conversation if i wanted to do a show about this movie lola nobody would tune in i do a show about ahsoka thousands of people tune in and will tell me i'm wrong <laughs> you know, and that's fine, but that's where we're at culturally. And I think that, that like you've always pointed out, there's a lot of movies being made. We're seeing movies from around the world come to America. It's just the cultural conversation tends to be dominated by certain movies when they come out. And yet there's a lot of great stuff coming and the world, the universe proved that people will tune up, turn up for a Barbie and an Oppenheimer. The Oppenheimer, a bi three hour biopic about the guy from create the atomic bomb is almost going to make a billion dollars if you would ask me if i had that on my 2023 bingo card john i would have said no i would have said five or six at tops maybe i would have been off by and that's bunch. only because it's nolan i didn't think yeah. dunkirk would make half a billion dollars but it did but 
the light, the world, the world will will always surprise you. But you know what? To, to your point, the studios have always been a supply and demand enter enterprise, right? What the audiences want, what the audiences are looking for, and what the audiences are paying for, that's what the studios will focus on. And like you said, it changes. That changes from decade to decade. I want to go back to like to the year before the pandemic. Okay, the year before the pandemic, the last kind of regular year we had. Right. I just pulled this up randomly. I said, well, Warner Brothers movies in 2018, right? Is it all franchises and comic book films? They did the film by the, and you're, you're talking about comedies, Rob. Tag, which I really liked. Yep. You know, uh, Tag, you don't have to have the screen up there. But they had they had Tag. They had the 1517 to Paris. They had Game Night, which was a wonderful comedy. Didn't do great at the box office. They did 12 Strong. They did The Mule. Uh, they did A Star is Born, which of course was a remake, but whatever. They did They Shall Not Grow Old. They put out, like, that's just one studio in right. one year. Now, that year they also put out Tomb Raider. Yeah. And they also put out Aquaman. Yes. And they also put out uh, Pacific Rim Uprising, but we won't. Nobody likes to talk about that. But they, they put out a mix. And like this year, this has been one of the best years for comedies in ages but the audience isn't going to them and they're not going to support them we've got a big fairly big budget sci-fi movie coming out this week called the creator which right now the people who've seen it are not just saying it could be one of or the best film of the year they're saying it's one of the all-time great sci-fi classics already we haven't seen it it's tracking to make 15 to 20 million dollars opening weekend so, again, studios make these movies. But decade to decade, as Rob pointed out, the culture changes, what is trending changes. You know, they don't make as many buddy cop movies in the, today as they did in 1980s or the 1990s. But that all happens in cycles, and it comes and it goes. But... And also, you know, we have different forms of entertainment that we didn't have when, you know, Scorsese was coming up being a cineast yeah. in the 60s and when he started editing, making stuff like Boxcar Bertha early in his career. It's just a different time. And people forget, you know, dude, I, I fell down, talk about rabbit holes. I fell down a rabbit hole about the most profound video game ever made. And, and it's the most profound scene. And it was a scene in Metal Gear Solid 2. When, when Raiden talks to this AI and it's revealed to be that this AI has been behind everything, there's not even a real person behind it. And I'm like, I got so in, entranced by this conversation. And went down. I'm like, this is pretty profound stuff. And I'm like, this is some heady sci-fi AI commentary. And I never got to the end of Metal Gear Solid 2. I have the game. I love that franchise. And Kojima's the man. But I mean, I, I wow. It's a video game. All right, guys. Question is for you. What do you think about it? Again, I, I think there's truth in what Scorsese is saying here. I just think he's overlooking that it's truth that goes both ways, and there's some pretty major things he's kind of bypassing there. But whatever you feel about that, jump on down to the comments and let us know. Hey, guys, thanks so much for watching this video. Make sure you like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to our channel. And don't forget, we have a daily podcast called The John Campy Show Podcast, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting app of choice. Go and subscribe to it today so it'll be there when you need it.